bright field microscope. Bright field microscope can be used to observe intracellular structures of cells. Awesome. You just missed the first question on the test. Let me repeat my question one more time. Bright field microscope can be used to observe the intracellular structures of the cells. <coughs> First you said false, then you said true. <coughs> Let me draw a bacteria. Okay, here's a bacterium. Okay. Name one intracellular structure of a bacterium. Nucleus. Name one. Nucleus. Nucleus. You just missed the second question on the test. No, 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 no. Bacteria don't have a nucleus. <coughs> so name one intracellular structure of a bacterium. Yeah. 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 All right. yeah. Yeah. So question is if I ask you to observe DNA of this bacterium under bright field microscope, can you see it? <coughs> Most of you, all of you told me, no, you can't. So, I'm telling you, yes. But last time you told us, yes, <coughs> or no. Did I tell you no? No. 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 I told you. No. Read your notes, please. <laughs> what is the key word I asked you to underline? Wow. No, 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 not top. No, 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 not at all. Let me ask you the question the same. Same. Same question, three lines. Can you see the intracellular structures of living bacteria? No. No. See the difference? Name, okay. <laughs> I didn't hear you what you said. <laughs> okay. Right. You need a bit. That was my first question, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> no, seriously. You have to ask this. I mean, this is one of the questions on the test. Similar question. So, can you see intracellular structures of bacteria under bright field microscope? Yes. 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 All you have to do is stain them. Stain them. You stain this DNA, and you can see it. Absolutely. You want to see a ribosome. Ribosome under bright field microscope. Can you see it? Sure. Stain it, and you can see it. Actually, next week, okay, this one we talk about endo. You will not see a single thing on the test that I have not talked about. I'm going to practice with you. Get on. And you see endospore under bright field? Yes, you do. And you are going to stain it. You are going to do this in the lab. You are going to stain the endospore, and then you can see it. But living cell? No. I'm going to, we are going to talk about different types of microscopes. So you are going to have a situation, and then you are going to pick what type of microscope is appropriate. All right? <clears throat> so for now, we have only talked about bright field. That's it. Can you see living cells under bright field microscope? Yes. Yes, you can. How about motility? Remember, I showed you motility under the microscope. So yes, you can see living cells, but not inside the living cell. Yes. 
There's a question in your lab manual. Those of you who are not in the lab may not be able to answer, and I will not ask you this on the test. But there's a lab question in your lab manual. How do you differentiate? How can you differentiate between <clears throat> two structures with the same shape? There's one structure, and there's another structure with the same shape. One is living, the other one is non-living. How can you tell under the bright field microscope that one is living, the other one is non-living? This is under um, um, motility versus Brownian motion. This one is non-living. Non-living, and this is living. Remember, anything suspended in water will vibrate in water, right? Brownian motion. And let's say both are non-motile. Both, both are non-motile, so if you put them, this is staph, staph, one cell of staph, and this is just dust particles that happen to look like staph cell. They both have the same shape, same shape. So how can you tell, they look identical. How can you tell one is living, the other one is not living? That's the question. Yes? No, 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 no. This is non motile. Living, but non motile. Non motile. You mean without the staining? Without the staining. What is the characteristic of life? Reproduction. There you go. Excellent. Reproduction. After half an hour, this cell is going to. Reproduce. This dust particle is not going to reproduce. This is the answer for reproduction. Okay, that's it. Keep on watching. Keep on watching. You have to have to some time. Cell is going to reproduce. Dust particle or non-living matter is not going to reproduce. Okay, that's the answer. Okay, that's it. I know I'm drifting away, so let's just start the new material. We have to finish up the sheet today. Okay. All right. <coughs> It's no more living. When you stain a cell, it is no more living. Why? One of the steps in staining is keeping dark field. We stop right here, right? Dark field. Now, dark field microscope is just like bright field. Now, I'm going to just hold on one second. The path of light is exactly the same. I'm going to come back one second. Path of light in dark field is exactly the same as light of bright field. But look at this metal disc right here. In the path of light, you place a metal disc right here. What it does is it blocks most of the light. And the light only travels okay, on the edges right here. So most of the background you see right here 
is pitch dark. <coughs> why do we need why do we need this type of microscope? Because heat sensitive. So only those materials, for especially those microorganisms that are heat sensitive. Heat sensitive, especially for those microorganisms that are heat sensitive. Okay. Right. Heat sensitive materials. That's a special use for this type of microscope. <coughs> and again, in red, make sure that you make a note of this. I'm not sure if this is in your notes or not. Cannot be used to observe intracellular structures of both living or non-living. Doesn't matter, you just cannot go inside the cell, period. Under bright field at least, you can go inside of living. But here, you cannot. Why not? Tell me. Even if non-living, you no, cannot. No, no, no. Why not? Yeah, 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 yeah even if non-living. Oh, okay. You accidentally said you can see inside of living. I did? Yes. Yeah. That's okay. If not, <laughs> <laughs> erase. Erase. Oh, erase. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No, why can't? Why can't you go inside non-living? Why can't you see that? Let's say if you stain. Exactly. Let's say if you stain yourself and you observe it in the dark field, no contrast. Specimen is dark, background is dark. No contrast. That's why you cannot see intracellular structure of non-living cells. So it's only good for heat sensitive cells or cells that are sensitive to desiccation, meaning drying, drying. If you dry, you take the moisture away and they will break. For example, Bacterium that causes syphilis, Triponema pallidum. Very sensitive to desiccation. You have a roommate who has syphilis. Very unhygienic person. Pees all over the toilet seat in the morning. And now it's your turn. Keep them out like that. And it's your turn after half an hour or two, or two hours. Okay. So. If you don't use it, okay, if you don't clean it and just sits right on top and you have open sores on your butt, hmm. you have, that's how diseases are transmitted, really believe me. So if you don't clean the toilet seats okay, within the two hours of the previous, you are okay because this organism cannot survive desiccation, dryness, it will disintegrate. On the other hand, let's say if you are unfortunate, you have a roommate who has TB. Have you seen people spitting all the time? Okay. Driving by or just walking by? Yes. This nasty habit of spitting for some reason. I don't know why. But they do that. <clears throat> so if you have a person who spits all the time or happen to have TB, you know how long this bacteria, TB bacteria, can survive in the sputum? 12 months. It has a special lipid in the cell wall. I'll give you the name later. But if a person stays on the wall, it can survive in that dry split of up to 12 months. Okay. Now imagine a person who has full-blown HIV, one sniff of that dry split. Not a healthy person. Healthy person probably needs several exposures. Full-blown HIV, one sniff is enough to get active TB. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Dark field. Oh, here are some pictures of dark field microscope. Bacteria that causes uh, Lyme disease. <coughs> Syphilis. Triponema pallidum. Triponema pallidum. Triponema pallidum. Syphilis. Syphilis is not only uh, sexually transmitted, but it can be any part of your body. This is the only microscope, make sure that you underline it, highlight it, that allows you to go inside the living cells. In addition to, in addition to looking at the living cells, stain cells, dark field, this is kind of multitasking, master of all trades. Okay. This is the one that is excellent for observing intracellular structures, underline it, highlight it. 
but you can also see stained preparations, okay. unstained preparations, living cells. It will do everything for you. But the most common use is to observe intracellular <laughs> structures of living cells. Living cells. This is called phase contrast. Sometimes it is also called interference or confocal lens. Endospore, everyone knows what endospores are. Ribosomes. Everyone knows ribosome, right? DNA. Inclusion body is a new term. What is inclusion body? Inclusion body is all living cells. They have intracellular storage areas. They store fat, sometimes sulfur, phosphate. Some microorganisms, they store gas, actually, believe it or not. Gas. Why do they want to store gas inside them? We don't store gas. We release gas, right? Okay. Some organisms store gas inside them. Why? Why do cells want to store gas? What type? Remember cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, photosynthetic. So they live in ponds like green algae. They store gas so they can float on surface of water so they can absorb light. Photosynthetic microorganisms. They store gas inside them. So inclusion bodies are intracellular storage areas. Intracellular storage areas. All right. Before we go to the next microscope, next one is called fluorescent microscope. Fluorescent microscope. But before I go to that one, let me give you an example. <clears throat> You're working in a lab, microbiology lab, and you just receive a pathological specimen, like urine. A person may have syphilis. So here is the urine. Here is the bacterium that causes syphilis. Squiggly thing. Remember, this bacterium is called, this is called, uh, what is this that called? Tripolema pallidum. pallidum. <clears throat> Heat sensitive. Sensitive to desiccation. Cannot stain it. If you stain it, it's going to break, break into another pieces. It will, uh, Die. So you take a drop of urine. On the test, I will ask you what type of microscopy is appropriate to observe this specimen. Excellent. Dark field. So far, the one that we have talked, right field, dark field, face contrast. The best is dark field. Dark field. So you take a drop of urine and put it on this side and you observe it under dark field microscope. What will be the color of this specimen? Blue? Where did that come from? Blue. The background is what color? Dark. Dark. And the bacterium will be? Colorless. You can say white, colorless, no color. That's because you said dark field. Pardon me? Why you dark field? Dark field? Mm -hmm. Because this is sensitive to heat. Yeah. It is sensitive to desiccation, no drying. This is just drop of water. We did not That's heat fix it. Working, right? You're not going to just do that picture. No picture. 
Oh, just you're going to say what it is. I'm going to give you options what type of microscopy. And I'll give you no, a scenario. Like, like you just said, it's, um, it's heat sensitive yes, and all that. You're going to say that. Absolutely. Okay. On the test, I will give you bold letters. I will highlight the word that I want you to concentrate on. Yes. So this is what you see. Now, can you pick up the phone? Can you write your report and send it to the doctor? The person has syphilis? Just by doing doctor microscopy. No. 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 Why not? There may be other bacteria that are heat sensitive. Very good. Because it bacteria just looks like bacteria that causes syphilis. Remember Anton von Leeuwenhoek? What did he use? He didn't use his pee. He used strength. He used his gum material. Remember? And one of the bacteria that he observed was from his mouth. Spirochete that looked like this. And he literally fell off from his chair when he saw bacteria moving in his mouth. What if? What if this person is just really a nasty person, very unhygienic person, really? <laughs> and he puts his fingers in his mouth, and he has been transferring his mouth bacteria where they don't belong. <laughs> really? He puts his fingers in his mouth, and they go Puff, right there. Really? There are people like that. Yeah. And this is false positive. <laughs> So these are his mouth bacteria. He doesn't have syphilis, and they just show up in his pee, right? So you cannot. So what you are saying is right. This is false positive. It looks like syphilis bacteria. So you can never just because something looks like syphilis is false positive. No. That's you did the experiment today in lab. Staphylococcus epidermidis. It looks like staph or is MRSA. So if you do a gram stain from a person for MRSA, and it looks like MRSA, but it's actually normal flora of the person. By doing gram stain, you cannot just send a report and tell the person, oh yeah, the person has MRSA. Oh no, 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 that's the normal flora of the person. You have to do additional tests. So, <clears throat> now to confirm this, you have to do additional <coughs> tests. And one of the additional tests for microscopy is called fluorescent microscopy, which will test if this is really syphilis or not, within minutes. Literally within five minutes, five to 10 minutes. Other tests, they may require days or hours, but this type of microscopy, which is called fluorescent microscopy, will confirm any disease, infectious disease, within few, oh, oh, within few minutes. This is uh, the diagram, I think, I was trying to explain intracellular and extracellular structures. So this is picture in chapter four. This is a typical bacterium, and this is the layer that defines intracellular structure and extracellular. Anything that is inside cell membrane, plasma membrane, it is anything. It is inside this yellow membrane, is intracellular. Everything that is outside, including cell wall, capsule, flagella, all these little hair-like structures, is a fimbri, fimbri. Remember, please, no bacteria have cilia. No bacteria have cilia. So anything inside it. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Okay. Come on. Fluorescent microscopy. This is the one that is commonly used to do what? Diagnose infectious diseases. There's a couple of examples, but you can diagnose any disease. But you must have some idea what you are trying to diagnose. You cannot just randomly use this microscopy. <coughs> what does it do? Let me show you this here, and I'll show you the picture in your book. It's a very nice diagram here. It exposes a specimen, like this one right here on the board. It exposes a specimen, this specimen, which is previously treated with two things. Previously treated with fluorescent dye and antibody. Fluorescent dye doesn't say antibody. It could be acridine or fluorescent and antibody. Please add the word fluorescent dye and antibody. You must have antibody. Fluorescent dye and antibody. 
to a ultraviolet light. And then it makes an image of the specimen. Let's look at that in your test. is on page number Let's say you're working in a lab, and remember, this is the specimen you are testing. This is confirmation test now. If the person has syphilis or not, where did you get these antibodies from? Okay. There are biological companies who sell these antibodies. Okay. They take this bacteria, they take the pathogens, and they inject them in animals, cows, horses, pigs. They give, they give them disease. Okay. They give them syphilis. TB and other diseases, and after about a month or so, okay, they get their blood out, okay, uh, they separate the antibodies, and they sell them for thousands of dollars. And that's how they make their billions every year. That's why the tests are expensive. Okay. So they have these antibodies in the freezer, and they, these are the dyes that glow under UV light, atrodine fluorescein dyes. So as soon as they have the specimen, Okay. Pathological specimen. They mix the antibody with the dye in a test tube. And here's your specimen on a slide. Right here. Bacterium that causes syphilis. Now, all biological entities, all pathogens, okay, they have what on their surface? These spikes that you see right here? Antigen. Antigens. All microorganisms, viruses, bacteria, fungi, your cells. Okay. They have antigens on their surface. So remember, this bacterium is sensitive to heat. But we must fix or attach this bacterium to the slide, or it will wash away. So instead of heat, we use a chemical to attach this bacterium to the glass. Chemical fixation. Normally, we use what? Heat. Heat fixation. But this time, we are going to use a chemical. So after chemical attachment, we flood the slide with a mixture of fluorescein and antibody. It's like key and lock. Now just imagine now, if this bacterium was from the mouth of this person and not the syphilis bacteria, would this antibody attach to the antigen? No. no. So we we'll let this reaction take place for about five minutes. And then we wash off the slide with water and observe the slide under this microscope that I have in my lab. Okay. Instead of the regular light, we attach it to UV light source and observe the slide. Under UV light, if this antibody is attached, it is going to glow. And this is the actual picture right here. If antibody is still attached to microorganism, then you can see the bacteria right here. If the glow is present, bacteria present. Now, if this bacteria was from his mouth, what would I see? Dark. Pitch dark. <coughs> Nothing. Okay. If I see the glow, I can pick up the phone and say, stay away from this guy. Dark. Okay. <laughs> I have a question. Sure. For the fluorescence uh, stain, um, I understood because of the heat sensitivity. But if we want, can we just use it for any bacteria or any organism? Any organism. 
Oh, okay. Absolutely. So the antibody doesn't have any specific chemical structure to bind to that? Uh... Not really. Oh, okay. My master's thesis was from, uh, I used this technique. Okay. I established a model that proved that if you suffer from strep throat a lot, in the long run, your chances of arthritis are greater because if you, I told you that, right? Yeah. This is what I used. Okay. Antibody. There's antibody accumulates in your cartilage, and this is what I used. I took the fluorescent and I showed the rats cartilage. The, the fluorescent antibody glows. Make sense? I'm not sure about how do you identify that it's syphilis? Oh, because the antibody is syphilis. If you take TB antibody, it will be TB. Okay. If you take gonorrhea, it is gonorrhea. It's not just any antibody. Oh, so absolutely. What, so, but how do you know, what's how do you know which antibody to use here? I mean, you, that's what I'm saying. You cannot randomly use any. You cannot use TB antibody for syphilis. You have to have some idea. So based on symptoms, you go to the doctor, exactly. based on certain symptoms you have, and right. in the lab, you, when you send out to the lab, this say you're testing for syphilis, they yeah. use a syphilis. If it was gonorrhea or whatever it is, it would use it. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. Last type of microscope, electron microscope. Three things I want you to remember about electron microscope. Number one, of course, no light. Instead of light, it uses a beam of electrons. Number two, magnification. Ten thousand to. 100,000. And this is for living cells. For non living, it is much more light, greater. Look at the, and the second thing is magnific uh, resolving power 0.3 nanometer. Billion of a meter with nine zeros. 0.3 nanometer. Why do you want to use it? the smallest items. If you want to see fine structure of a bacterium, if you want to see the structure of cell wall, structure of the ribosome, structure of fimbri. What is this? Someone told me it looks like Mickey Mouse. I don't see Mickey Mouse. Do you? I mean, you don't see the ears. Oh. Yeah. 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 Okay, if you see me. Okay, I know, but this is the deadliest virus on this planet. Ebola. Oh my God. Yeah, this is Ebola virus. The person dies in 10 days and bleeds in all openings of their bodies. Ears, nose, eyes, and they die. There is no cure. This Ebola virus. How do you get so many of these? Ebola. So if you want to see a virus, or any fine structure, okay? Any fine ultra or fine structure, you would use electron microscope. How do you get the Ebola virus? The Ebola virus, there are several theories. No one has been able to actually prove it, but it is there have been few outbreaks in Africa, and people believe that they get it from eating uh, animals. They, people consume animals, like monkeys and other animals in Africa. That's how they get it. But, no, but you can, you can get exposed. Of course, they can draw animals. Yes. It can it can transmit by air droplet also, right? Uh, no, no, no. Yes, you have to come in contact with the person. Oh. Not through the No, if you come in contact, just contact. Like breathing. Not through breathing. No. No. Person to person. Oh, that's good. Person to person. Can you just verify those three things? The first sure. one was not using like... Uh, beam of electrons, mm -hmm. magnification, okay. and resolving power. Right. Resolve power. So those are the five types of 
microscopes. Now we move on. The different, now we are going to concentrate on everything on the compound microscope. And starting with how do we prepare specimen for compound microscope and different types of stains. That's it. That's the end of chapter three. Any questions? Okay. Anyone to look at? What's that? A slide. <laughs> <That's laughs> slides. All right. And uh, whenever you prepare a specimen, okay, you can have two different types of preparation for bright film to be observed under bright field microscope. One is wet mount. What's a wet mount? Slide, cover slide. That's it, that's a wet mount. You take a slide, you put your specimen, okay, a drop of specimen, and you put a cover slide. Slide, specimen, cover slide. That's a wet mount. Like something from a brass? Yep, a pond water semen, fertilization, whatever you want to do. But the, the disadvantage is the specimen is squished under your cover slip. Not a whole lot of space for the specimen to move around for activity. The better, if you want to see motility, if you're working in uh, in vitro fertilization, you want to see the fertilization process, cell division, mitosis and all that, the better way is what? Hanging drop method. Hanging drop. Okay. In hanging drop method, you use a special slide. A slide that has a depression. A slide that is on Prozac. <laughs> there you go. So where did you put the specimen? In the depression. In the depression? On the cover slide. On the cover slide. You take a cover slide, you put the specimen in the, co in the middle of the cover slide. In the middle of the cover slide, and then you make a ring of petroleum jelly around the depression, flip the cover slip, cover slip, flip the slide. By the way, the slide looks like this. Flip the slide, make the contact with the cover slip, pick it up, and here is your hanging drop right here. Petroleum jelly, and that's your specimen. And that's why it's called hanging drop method. That's what we use in the lab. So motility, number one, you can observe motility. <clears throat> what else can you observe? Outside structure. Pardon me? The outside of the structure. External structures? Yes. Sure. External structure of the cell. <coughs> this is all with the hanging down there. Yep. What else? Mitosis, fertilization, so. <clears throat> so what would you, why would 
to ever use the lead. Easier, not because it's not everybody has access to a depression slide. It's expensive. It's expensive slides. What about phagocytosis? Phagocytosis, sure. Phagocytosis, sure. Phagocytosis. Now, tell me the disadvantages, disadvantages of these two preparations, wet mount and uh, hanging rock method. You have to have a live specimen. Pardon me? You have to have a live specimen. You have to have live specimen, and the disadvantage of live specimen, when you observe these live specimens under bright field. So, you can't see the internal structure? can't see the internal structure. And plus lack of contrast, lack of contrast. Background is bright, specimen has no color. So the best way to observe your specimen under bright field is to stain it. If you want to observe your specimen under bright field, yes, you can see them, absolutely all these things. But the best way to observe your specimen under bright field is to stain it. Right now I'm going to drop. This is the best way. Fix your specimen either by chemical or by heat. If your specimen is heat sensitive, use chemical, but the most common method, heat fixation. And then stain it. Stain. What's a stain? Color. Color. Not just color. If you just have color. You, the color will not stick to the positive. color plus two more things. That makes a complete stain. Charge, and then solvent. Three things make a true stain. Okay. And there's a question on that on your test. And I'm going to practice with you before we leave. What is that? Something weird. I have no clue. <laughs> 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 okay, here we go. All right. So here are the three things. Let me explain it to you. <clears throat> True stain has number one. Number one is solvent. Solvent, benzene, solvent. Number two is the this is the color right here. Homo four is the color pigment color. So you take the color and you mix it with the solvent. And you color, get a color compound called chromogen. And even the chromogen is not the stain. It's not complete stain. You cannot stain anything with chromogen. You pour chromogen on a white lab gown. You put it in the washer. Lab gown is going to turn white. It's not going to stick to it. It's because it's lacking the third component. Charge. No charge. Oxochrome is the one that adds charge to the chromogen. Either positive charge or negative charge. One more time. Benzene is solvent. Chromophore is color pigment. Color. Chrome is the color and four is the pigment? I think so. Four. Yes, it's been so long that we learned these things, I forgot, but I'll double check. Chrome is colored, for sure. Four, and I don't remember. Chrome is colored. So chromogen, color compound. <coughs> Oxochrome, charge. So, stains can be classified on the basis of oxochrome, positive or negative. Class stains can be classified into two major categories. Those that have positive charge, we call them cat ionic. Those that have negative charge, we call them anion. Before we go to anion and cationic, please make a note that all bacteria are negatively charged. All bacteria are negatively charged.
So if you want to stain your bacteria, you must use cationic dye. But this is an easy way to remember. When I was a student, I always had a hard time remembering which one has positive charge, which one has negative charge. So one day, when I was in grad school, a little bulb just came up. Boing! See this little T right here? Positive, right here. Cat. It's true, right here. Cat. That's positive. Basic or cat We have positive charge. Okay. So if you want the same bacteria, you use basic or cat Sometimes we do use anionic dyes to stain bacteria. No, let me take it back. Stain bacteria? No. You can't stain bacteria, but we do flood bacteria. But it is called, yeah, it is called negative stain. We do stain bacteria with uh, acidic dye. But it's not like staining bacteria. It's staining the background. Okay? If you, okay, if you use acidic dye to stain bacteria, what would be the color of the bacteria? Clear. Clear, colorless. Because bacteria are negatively charged, dye is negatively charged. They repel each other. There are only three dyes that are negatively charged. Eosin, nitrosin, picric acid. If you put these dyes on the bacteria, bacteria will remain colorless. I'll come back to this one second. Page number six of your atlas. That's your negative stain. In this stain, I have used nitrosin. Nitrosin background is black. That gray remains colorless. Is that what? Kind of like a film when it is negative. Is that the same principle or not? Probably negative. The background remains right. Yeah. And simple stain, the one that you are doing today. Simple stain, you use one cationic stain. One cationic stain, doesn't matter which one. Whichever you use, that they will pick up that stain and the background is bright. Purple, purple, red. What's the difference between simple stain and negative stain? Difference. Background. In simple stain, the bacteria is colored. Simple stain, bacteria is colored, and in negative stain, bacteria remains colorless. What's the similarity between the two? Similarity. In the staining procedure, what's the similarity between the two? They both use one stain. Similarity between the negative stain and the simple stain, they both use one stain. The difference is, one uses cationic stain, the other one uses anionic stain. Simple stain uses cationic stain and stains with bacteria, right? One cationic stain and stains the bacterium in simple stain, I mean in negative stain, we use one anionic stain. That is the similarity. Staining. 
situate your question in which I'll give you a situation where you have to decide what type of staining you have to perform. Whenever you receive a pathological specimen, sputum, urine, urine or whatever, if you are given a choice of types of staining, simple, differential, acid baths, endospore, and we are going to talk about these. Which one are you going to do first? Simple. What's the purpose of simple stain? The purpose of simple stain that you're doing today is to look at the size, shape, and arrangement of my organ. All right, fine. And you always, as I just told you, how many stains do you use? One. One, One basic or cationic stain. No. no. On the other hand, if you do, or when you do a differential stain, okay. in differential stain we use two cationic stains. Two cationic stains of contrasting colors. Now, in differential stain, not only, not only that you can learn the size, shape, and arrangement, you can also classify microorganisms into different categories. Let me explain. In differential stain, not only that you can learn the size, shape, arrangement, but you can also differentiate bacteria into different categories. So if you have the choice of doing simple and differential, which one would you do first? What was the question? If you receive a urine specimen, a person has UTI, okay. and you have the choice between simple and differential, which one are you going to do first, simple or differential? Differential. Differential. Because when you do differential, not only you are going to learn the size, shape, and arrangement, plus you, can, you will be able to differentiate between bacteria, gram-positive, gram-negative. No. I'm going to explain and you will make it. It will make more sense. Okay. Let's talk about differential in a little bit more detail. What is differential stain? Okay. <coughs> the most common differential stain, it was introduced to us by Christian Graham. <coughs> Christian Graham, okay. very old technique. This is the staining procedure that is done on most pathological specimens, the very first, with the exception of few. If the doctor has done x-ray of the chest and there are white spots and you have received a sputum, then you don't do this. There's a special differential stain that you do. But on most pathological specimens, this is the one that you do. Okay. This differential stain, it classifies most microorganisms most into two categories. Gram positive, at the end of the gram stain procedure, these microorganisms, they appear purple, and the other ones, they appear pink or red. Okay. Now let's, let's look at the gram staining procedure first, and then I'll explain you the principle, why. Why do they appear purple, and why do they appear purple? All right. Uh, Two to three questions on this on your test. Okay, let me explain it to you. <clears throat> First of all, gram stain it uses. Gram stain. It uses four reagents. Four reagents. And how many stains? Two stains, but four reagents. Four. Reagents. One more thing before we move on. Two dyes, right? Whenever you do a differential stain, it doesn't matter which one, we are doing gram stain, doesn't matter which differential stain you do, you always use the dark colored dye first and the lighter colored dye second. Always. All right. So the first reagent, number one, is crystal violet. 
stress the lilac. <coughs> and this is called the primary stain. Primary stain. <coughs> Number two, grams iodine. Grams iodine. This is called the mordant. Mordant. Number three is. 95% ethyl alcohol. This is the decolorizer. And finally, Fourth reagent is your saffronin. This is your <coughs> counter stain. Counter or secondary stain. Secondary stain. These are your four reagents. <coughs> now let's look at them. Procedure, then we'll come back and look at the principle. On page number 68. <clears throat> Start just like you did in the lab today. Some of you will do this later. You make a nice clean smear, thin, thin smear on the last slide. Okay. Oops. <clears throat> Notice that this specimen has two types of bacteria round or caucus shape and rod or bacillus shape. So you make a smear. After making the smear, you air dry your smear and heat fix it. After heat fixation, you flood your smear with the primary stain, crystal violet. And then it stand on your smear for one minute. After one minute, you wash your slide with water, rinse off the extra stain, no blotting or drying in between the steps. And then you add the, the secondary reagent, second reagent, which is Gram's iodine. Notice any change in the color? No. But it should be dark color, dark purple, almost blackish color. Which they should have made it dark, but they didn't. But I'll tell you on the board why. So no change, they both are kind of purplish. You let it stand for another one minute. After one minute, you wash off Gram's iodine okay, and continue. No blotting, no drying. Look what happens here when you rinse your slide with the third reagent. This is the most crucial okay, uh, step of the Gram stain, the decolorization. Right here. Because this is the step that differentiates between the two bacteria. Notice, some bacteria they have lost their color. Others, they are holding on to their color. Let me ask you this. What do you think? Which bacterium should be called the gram positive? The one that is holding on to the color or the one that has lost its color? Holding on. Holding on. Positive, the one that holds on to the color is called positive. The one that loses, has lost its color, is called grand negative. Now, can I stop this process right now 
the gram stage process right now. If I pull my slide right now, observe it under the microscope, can I differentiate between gram positive and negative? Yeah. Yes? Actually, yes. So sometimes I do ask this question on the quiz or on the, on the test. Which of the four steps can be skipped and still be able to differentiate between gram positive and negative? The answer four. is? Four. four. So but what we do? We do complete the whole process. Why? Because if I observe my slide right now, remember one of the problem is if the bacteria has no color and the background is bright, you can see it really well. So we do go to the fourth step. We put our saprinarian. Now the clear bacteria becomes pink, and the purple remains purple because the purple is the dominant color. Even if you pour the pink color on, red color on, the purple will remain purple. Okay. So now we leave the pink color separate in for one minute, wash, dry, blot, and observe it with the microscope. Gram positive remains purple, gram negative becomes pink or red. Okay, now let me explain to you why. I'm going to go on the board and see why. So this is the actual picture right here. You can see purple and pink. All right. Now there are two factors, before I go to the principle, there are two factors that will cause gram-positive bacteria to appear pink. Gram-positive are supposed to be what color? Purple. But sometimes they also appear Pink. There are two reasons that they, they will appear pink. Number one, age. Age. Old age. Number one, old age. In bacterial terms, old age is 24 hours or older. 24 hours or older. Older culture is considered older culture. So that's one factor. And second, over decolorization. Over D over decolorization. How long are we supposed to, did I tell you how long are we supposed to decolorize? No, no I didn't say that, sorry. 15 seconds, sorry. Yeah, 15 seconds, oh yeah, we are supposed to decolorize our slide for 15 seconds or less. Decolorization, I did tell you all for one minute, but decolorization is 15 seconds or less, okay? 15 seconds with alcohol. We are supposed to wash our slides for 15 seconds. Go ahead. Um, I thought I heard you say two factors that gram positive will be It should be yes. gram negative. No, no, no. Gram positive. Yes. Gram positive is a purple. I know. I know. Why I'm telling you exceptions. Okay, but yeah. well, up there it says gram negative. I know. To the pink. I know. I'm telling you exceptions. Normally, normally gram positive or purple, but there are two factors, two exceptions. Under those conditions, gram positive will be pink. So the, the so in other words, the dots would be pink Perfect. instead of purple. Exactly. Okay. Why would they be pink? These are the reasons. Okay. Well, let me explain. Over decolorization. What will over decolorization do? First, I have to explain the principle to you, then I'll explain it, okay? So, remember, this is only for gram positive, and those gram positive that appear pink because of these two reasons, these are called gram variable. Gram variable. Gram variable. Gram variable bacteria are gram positive bacteria that are supposed to be purple, but they appear pink because of old age or over decolorization. 
Now let's look at the new principle quickly. And we'll take a couple of extra minutes. I don't want to wait until next time. These are the four reagents. Crystal okay. violet, iodine, ethyl alcohol, etc. Okay. This is the cell wall of gram positive bacteria, cell wall of gram negative bacteria. And these black lines that I have drawn, these dots right here, they represent lipid. Gram positive bacteria, they have less lipid. Gram negative bacteria, they have more lipid. More lipid. More gram negative and gram positive, less. Quickly, let's do gram stain. First, we add crystal violet. Right? Both bacteria, they appear. What color? Purple. Purple. Then we add iodine. Now this is what happens when you add iodine. Iodine literally wraps around, this is crystal violet. This is iodine. Literally wraps around iodine, crystal violet to make it bigger, larger molecule. So I'm going to make, just literally make it bigger, like this, like that. This is called CVI complex, crystal violet iodine complex, CVI complex, CVI complex, in both cells, CVI complex. When you do the gram stain next week, you notice your slide will turn out almost black because of CVI complex. No change in color, right? Now you add what? Ethyl alcohol, which I mentioned you right here. For how long? 15 seconds. Now, when you add alcohol, both bacteria will lose their lipid. Lipid will come out from the cell wall. But because of the loss of lipid, who has bigger opening in the cell wall? Negative. Excellent. As soon as the lipid comes out, what do you think will happen to CVI complex from gram negative? They'll come out. Look at the picture. What happens to it? Colorless. Gram positive is able to hold its color, CVI complex. Gram negative is colorless. Okay? Because of lots of lipid, CVI complex is gone. Because of less lipid, CVI complex stays in. Because of less lipid, the opening in the cell wall of gram positive vector is small. CVI complex stays in. Because of lots of lipid in the cell wall, opening in the cell wall is huge. CVI complex, out, clear, colorless. Make sense? Kind of? <clears throat> then you add saffronin. Colorless bacteria becomes pink or red. And when you mix purple with pink, which one is more dominant? Purple. Gram positive remains purple. Gram negative becomes, remains pink or red. 
One more time. No? Okay. <laughs> so let me ask you this. What is the principle of gram stain? The gram stain differentiates bacteria on the basis of lipid concentration of the cell wall. Gram positive bacteria have less lipid, they lose less lipid, and the cell wall opening is small. So they are able to hold on to the CDI complex. Gram positive, gram negative bacteria, they have more lipid in the cell wall. So they are unable to hold their CDI complex. Okay. If you're wondering what I'm talking about, quickly, very quickly, let me just show you this. If you have the book, you can go home and look at this, please. This picture, right here, on page number 85. This is gram-positive cell wall. Almost no lipid. Look at this cell wall right here. Almost no, no lipid. The entire cell wall has no lipid. Right here. This is gram-negative. Right the entire cell wall is made up of lipid. So when we wash it with alcohol, this layer is all washed. It's gone. It dissolves. I'll repeat this one more time next time. Okay. Have a safe weekend.